it's interesting to see how John is so, he's very in tune with every single person on the mat. He's looking at every single person that is training right now and observing and watching where they're going wrong, how their positioning is. And this group, as you can see, is training at full capacity. They're not messing around. This is not, this is not a, a gym where you come in here and you half-ass anything because you're, you're gonna get f***ed up for sure. Head and arm control, all the way through to his armpit on this side, and then I cover my watch. The big key to this is that I get my, my knee, because that's what's going to cause almost a triangle type pressure, my shin in between his leg and his arm. My leg is, my knee is in tight here, wrapped over with my leg. I'm curious to know, like, you know, from, from everyone, from, from Connor to James to Artem, to all these guys that you've, you've brought up, they all have the same similarity when it comes to, you know, there's the showmanship, obviously, but they back it up in a way that their, their minds are so strong. Mm. And most of them will credit you for everything that they've learned um, from this whole mental standpoint of having, you know, you in their corner. You know, where does that come from? Like, how did you develop it? In college, I drifted towards the sciences more than the arts. Um, you know, I went on to study engineering and I was gonna be a maths teacher and then I stumbled into, into MMA and opened my first gym and I graduated and I ended up a hobby becoming a career. But I would credit, largely, I, got, I think I got very lucky that I got a certain group of guys that about 15 years or so ago, and I would, I would include Connor and that, Gunnar Nelson, uh, Colt Pendred and, and Ashling Daly and a few of these guys that were as obsessed as I was about training and technique and you know Connor was so creative with his striking and Gunnar Nelson was so creative with his grappling and I, I guess I was maybe good at putting a plan together and keeping us all training and motivated and then time just went on and we, we, we sort of trial and error on the national uh, circuit you know competing against other good clubs around Ireland and then eventually starting to go over to the UK and getting some success there and uh, you know before Connor had a guy Tom Egan he got his first break in the UFC we weren't quite ready at that stage we had a loss but it showed us that it's possible and that even even though it was a loss it was actually really uh, energizing for the rest of the team to see wait a minute we can do this you know you don't have to be just born in America to have a shot in the UFC kept the head down kept training and then and then the breaks came I think a large part of training is the ability just to show up every day you know everybody wants to know the new the coolest newest technique spinning technique or, or whatever and um, trying to find shortcuts but I don't think there is a way of escaping that this is something you've got to do for a couple of hours a day for 10 years and then all of a sudden you're skillful and do you seek or do you find or do you research um, any other coaches from outside of um, mixed martial arts? I got a great book off uh, Orla, Orla got me for one Christmas gift, Cornerman. I've actually given it to a few other coaches that I have a lot of respect for to read and it's about, it's about the boxing scene from say the 20s to the 60s and it talks about those coaches and their approach, the Ray Arsels and, and so on, like real legends of the boxing game that they would be cornering Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, every week for 10 years. And you know, there were expert cut men, there were expert nutritionists, expert psychologists, father figures, coach, coaches, the whole, the whole nine yards. And uh, I learned a lot from that book, just talk, different coaches talking about the development of a fighter and simple things like, you know, you've got, a, you've got a, a guy that's it's a good prospect. You sometimes have to be careful who he spars because Confidence is something that t it takes a long time to build up, but it can be shattered. And if you put that guy in with the wrong person at the wrong time, and they get badly hurt, you maybe you'll never see them again, or you'll, you'll see them getting beat up a little bit in the spar, and in the back of your head you're going, that's two years work there, to, just to get his confidence back to where it was. So I learned a lot from, from, from reading that book about, the, about planning and development of a fighter, and not, not day one, see this guy and put him against the best guy and five fives, and, he shattered, you know, you, you're, you're building them up and you're putting them against guys that are gonna push him but not destroy his confidence. There's no secret that you have had athletes that are high level athletes that are 110% unorthodox as fighters. A perfect example is this, you know, I'm gonna utilize Connor and James Gallagher, right? You know, they're both under your tutelage. 
both of them. You could easily say that both Connor and James, they've got the same kind of base, right? I, I, there was a phrase I saw recently, I can't think of exactly, but a paraphrase to basically say, like, as a coach, it's important that you make sure you get out of your athlete's way. That there's certain things that I think, no matter who you are, you have to understand about fighting and the coach, you, you've got to learn how to, you've got to learn how to do a double leg. You've got to learn how to throw one, two. You've got to learn how to defend a rear naked choke, you know? So we, we, there's certain aspects of MMA that for sure, it's my role and my job to make sure that the guys have a good understanding of those. But they will put their own flavor on it. And it's largely depending, I think, on, on personality. So when you see them in the gym, and this is built up over time, it's not one session. You don't just see the guy and go, oh, you're, the, you're gonna think back and rear naked choke. You're gonna faint people and, and hit them with big left hands. Um, we put them in different scenarios. We have them spar with many different body types. And over time, a picture starts to form. And then you do start to notice, okay, well, that guy's got great movement, he's got big power, he's unorthodox, so let's start building the rest of the game around that. I, I think Damian Mai is a, is, a, is a great example to use in terms of phenomenal fighter. I'm a huge fan of him, I study all his fights, but I did notice a period where I felt he was starting to become, or trying to become, a kickboxer. You know, he was training with the shootbox guys, and some of his fights, he was a lot of exchanges on the feed, and I thought that was a bit of a mistake, and I didn't think he was doing as well then. And then he went back to being, Jab, 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 shoot, single leg, take back, choke. And it was like a return to form. So I think it's good for fighters to explore and try different um, movements and try different sequences, try different strategies. But don't forget what got you to the, to the game. This team represents SBG, Ireland, and John. And you can tell there's a lot of pride behind it teaching the students and it's a lot of pride of making sure that the, uh, the coach understands that they're here to do work. You know, there's a lot of places that you don't see this kind of dedication anymore. It's very cool to see that even after numerous, you know, championship wins and all the hype and everything that's, you know, come around, you know, the, uh, the last couple years, you still see him on the mat right now with his students. There's not many people like that that have gotten athletes to where they're at. He has. Just wondering if it was too much energy. I can I can hit in or I can just like leave up. So the the confidence, you know, I spoke a little bit about when I reading that book, Corner Man, and you talk about right from a teenager being in your club, you start that confidence building and you make sure that they're competing at a level that's suitable for them. You want them challenged in the club, but you never want them just getting wrecked because that can take years to try and get back. So it, it is a gradual process of two years, four years, six years of getting to the stage where they are comfortable going out in front of a large crowd. You of course want to be able to prove to them that the, step, the techniques and, and methods that you're teaching work. And they've seen that from, from the fighters before them getting good results, that helps. But there is the part, you know, I've had some fighters, some of my amateurs and they're saying, look, I, I wanna go pro, but look, I never wanna do an interview and I never wanna, and I say, okay, stay amateur because that's amateurs is purely about the sport. You'll never have to do a face-off, there'll never be a press conference, there'll never be any of that kind of stuff, so just stay amateur. But the second somebody pays one dollar for your fight, you're now an entertainer. It's part sport, part entertainment. And the guys who get that earliest and understand that the number one thing for a professional fighter to do is to get the audience emotionally invested in them. Now, a lot of them might want to watch you to see you lose, and some will want to watch you win, but at least they want to watch you. And that, I believe, is what a sponsor wants to see, it's what a promoter wants to see, and it's what the main difference for me between an amateur and professional athlete is that you're a professional fighter, make sure the crowd is emotionally invested in you as a person, and as a fighter, and in your contest. Remaining honest with yourself, whatever way you can go about doing that.